Well, you heard it on the news, Canada's new strategy against ISIS. More money, more troops, more training, and no CF-18s. Does it make sense? Can it work? Janice Stein is the founding director of the Monk School for Global Affairs. She's in Toronto tonight. Colonel George Petrolikas is a retired member of the Canadian Armed Forces who served in Bosnia and Afghanistan. He joins us from Montreal. And Saeed Khan is a Middle East analyst at Wayne State University. He's in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Their thoughts in a moment. But first, some background. <laughs> Before today, Canada's ISIS strategy came from the Harper government. Support aircraft for refueling and intelligence gathering. Fewer than 100 special forces on the ground in Iraq to help train Kurdish fighters. And grabbing the headlines, at least in Canada, six CF-18 fighter jets joining the hundreds of coalition fighters dropping bombs on ISIS positions. Then, during the election, this from the man who would become prime minister. We are going to withdraw from the bombing mission. That declaration led to months of discussion and debate until today. A do-over and a new strategy. Not just the end of the CF-18 mission, but more troops on the ground, more aid and more diplomatic presence. This mission uh, not only is better than our last mission, but is the right thing to do. Where does this leave us in the big picture, both with our allies and with our role in the fight? time for some answers. All right, let's start with the basic question. Does this new plan make sense? Janice. I think it does, Peter. It pulls together with a three-year commitment. Uh, our diplomacy, uh, development assistance and humanitarian assistance, and an expanded role on the ground with the Peshmerga. Lots of details still to be filled in, but an integrated three-year timeline ahead, which should enable us to leverage our resources and plan ahead. George, uh, are you that convinced as well? Uh, n not entirely. I, you know, there, there are some merits to the plan of expanding training. Uh, certainly, from the get-go, we have always said that it will require the training of a local indigenous ground force to eventually take back territory. But it was never an either-or decision. And the air campaign was absolutely necessary to buy time for that ground force to be uh, prepared and to keep ISIS contained. Saeed, uh, you're watching all this from outside the country. Uh, what do you make of it? I see it, Peter, as a sensible and a pragmatic turn away from the unilateral military action that's underway. Uh, there's already a host of actors who are on the ground and in the air when it comes to the military intervention, really having little to no uh, consequence uh, or making any progress. At the same time, Canada's combat military footprint was really too small to be of consequence, and to go ahead then and try to expand it would probably not uh, be something that Canadians were willing to authorize uh, that course of action. All right. Let, let me move the the CF-18 question aside just for a moment and ask this question. Fundamentally, has the mission changed at all with what we saw announced today? Uh, once again, putting the CF-18s aside, has there been any fundamental change in the mission? George? Uh, in terms of what we're doing uh, on the ground assisting the Kurds, uh, I don't believe so. Uh, we are uh, going to increase our throughput. There are some details that are missing. There may be some helicopters that will be dispatched. There may be some medical teams that will be dispatched. And there are some questions that beg to be asked in terms of a, a discord between the statements of the minister, the prime minister and the military. Uh, we need to absolutely define what does combat mean, what does non-combat mean, and what are the limitations of that lest we go into another national paroxysm uh, if we come under attack again at some point in the future. Well, the Prime Minister seemed to make it clear that this was not a combat role, yet at the same time, those additional troops on the ground are not only there to train, but to um, assist was one of the words that uh, was used, advise and assist, which one assumes could place them in a combat role very closely. What, what do you make of that, Janice? Oh, I think there's no question, Peter, this is a more dangerous mission. Uh, than the mission that the Harper government authorized. And military spokesmen today uh, were quite clear about this. There is a risk of uh, death. There is a risk of casualties, soldiers being wounded, as they, in this euphemistic phrase, move right up to the front lines to assist 
combat forces that they are training. So this is different because it's an enhanced presence on the ground with a much higher degree of risk for our personnel. Saeed, you agree on that front? Yes, and I think that another uh, important component here, Peter, is the attention to humanitarian assistance. In that sense, Canada is uh, making a paradigm shift, taking the lead, which even many of the usual suspects, uh, Scandinavian countries and Switzerland, are not doing. $840 million over three years in actual humanitarian assistance, $270 million over three years to countries like Lebanon and Jordan, which are bearing quite a bit of the burden when it comes to the refugee influx and could potentially destabilize them, therefore metastasizing this issue in the region. So focusing on the humanitarian uh, assistance is a major step forward here. All right, George, I want to back up just for a moment once again to this issue of uh, danger in terms of this mission compared with the past one. Obviously, those CF-18 pilots were always facing some danger threat where, where they were. So were some of the trainers because they were close to the front lines. Do you see this in what was outlined today? like Janice does, as a potentially much more dangerous mission than the last I, one? I, I don't see it as much more dangerous because the threat has not changed. There will still be small arms fire and occasional engagements up near the front. Uh, so they're not exposed to a new threat like mines or gas or air attack. The possibility or the chances of something happen increase because you've tripled the amount of uh, troops that are there. That's right. I think that's the key point, Peter. We triple the number of, of special forces that will be engaged in this kind of activity. One thing that uh, was mentioned today in autumn, we don't have good enough details. We are going to double up on our intelligence assets. Does that mean only uh, the intelligence in the air from our surveillance and reconnaissance aircraft? Or does it mean forces and agents on the ground I think it means the second as well as the first and if that's the case of course there's more risk okay. you know one of the things that the defense minister has wondered aloud about in the last 10 days or so uh, is whether or not we have placed enough focus in the past about why we're in this situation not just how to fight it but why we're in it the so-called kind of root causes issue was that addressed at all in anything you saw today Saeed Absolutely, Peter. I mean, one of the root causes, of course, is military encroachment. This is something that ISIS uses very effectively in its rhetoric, in its recruitment tactics, and essentially forms a part of its raison d'etre. So the fact that this is being mitigated now by Canada is a major step forward in understanding how complex this issue is. It is certainly not the only root cause in what then gave rise to ISIS, but it is a major one to hopefully diffuse some of uh, what ISIS really wants and craves, which is a reason to go ahead and be violent and to be brutal by showing uh, to many of those who are under its control that this is what foreign military intervention does and it sees itself as being a counterforce to that. Janice, you don't seem to be buying that. Well, you know, I think the root causes are deeper than that. They're deeper than military encroachment. We have in this part of the world, Peter, a really serious failure in governance that is through the whole region and that's why everything else follows from that. Uh, you know, $870 million over three years. Yes, it's an increase, but it's a drop in the bucket, frankly. It's not going to be able to address the failures in governance, the lack of employment opportunities for young people. So we're doing what we can as a small country, but there is a much bigger problem here that no one really is addressing. George? Uh, if I can actually add to that, uh, the root causes are exacerbated by failures in governments which allowed a ethnic and sectarian split to arise in Iraq uh, between the Shias and the Sunnis which gave rise to a Sunni based ISIS uh, which gained traction amongst a lot of adherents in the Sunni tribes uh, and then pitted uh, that sector of society against others. So that part of the root cause has not been addressed. There may have been an opportunity given the questions or demands by Ash Carter and John Kerry for police training, at least for uh, uh, people that would police newly liberated cities in Iraq, like in Ramadi, Fallujah to come, potentially Mosul, to uh, instill a non-secular application of governance and the rule of law 
in some of those cities and I was rather disappointed to not hear that part of the root cause and whole of government piece being articulated today. So do you want to counter those two arguments? No, I fully agree. Uh, again, this is not the only root cause, but certainly it is a major one. Uh, when one listens to ISIS, and particularly when it comes to its recruitment, this idea that for the last 100 years the Middle East has been shaped by the actions particularly of the British and the French, and now you find continuous, uh, continuous and persistent Western intervention. Uh, having military intervention then simply fuels the fire of what ISIS is uh, going ahead and using in its rhetoric. All right. Last point. The Prime Minister has uh, received some criticism over the last uh, few weeks, he did again today, that he has yet to fully explain why it is the CF-18s are being pulled out. That there hasn't been a clear reason given to Canadians, many of whom, if the pollsters are right, feel they should be there. Janice, did he come any closer today to giving an answer on that? He really didn't, Peter, but I'm not um, at all worried uh, about that issue. I think in some senses that's not the right question. You know, that's six planes, and as George says, there are hundreds in the air right now. So the real question for us as Canadians, where's our comparative advantage? Where can we make a difference? And what came out today, and I think it's interesting, we are doubling down on the commitment we are making to the Peshmerga, to the Kurds in the north. There are long-term political implications for doing this. We're doing this. We're going to be in there for three years. And there's a good argument to be made that we will indeed have a greater effect doing that than our six airplanes in the air. That's not to say the, the aerial mission is not important, but rather to say we were not as instrumental in that aerial mission as we will be doing what we will be doing in northern Iraq. So did you get the last word? The, the plane's uh, an issue or a non-issue? Well, the political opposition was going to make an issue of this no matter what he said or didn't say. I think what the pivot really is, is Canada going back to its core competency and its core credibility to really move the needle away from just this exclusive and unilateral military intervention, which seems to be what only everybody else is interested in. All right. Saeed, Janice, George, thank you all for your thoughts on this one tonight.